there is significant low-hanging fruit for geothermal development in the world. From increased development of hydrothermal resources to the development of hot dry rock projects in the world's sedimentary basins. However, to achieve the goal of geothermal anywhere, we will need to economically develop deeper, hotter geothermal resources in harder rock types, a technological and engineering challenge. These deeper, hotter basement rock geothermal plays, referred to as super hot geothermal, exceed 400 degrees Celsius and could feasibly provide the world with terawatts of zero carbon energy, heat, and even support green hydrogen production. The basic concepts underlying super hot geothermal are the same as other concepts. A well is drilled into hot rock, fluid is circulated in the rock, and that hot fluid is then produced to the surface to provide direct use heat or produce electricity. What sets super hot apart is in its name. The higher temperatures being tapped in super hot systems provide higher energy densities and increase the efficiency of electricity production. These systems also present a unique set of technology and engineering challenges that need to be solved in order to make super hot, which some have called the holy grail of geothermal, a viable commercial reality. So what has been done so far in super hot research, development, and field demonstrations, and what were the outcomes? What are the major obstacles that are being addressed with new technologies and innovations? And what steps do we need to take in the coming years to make leaps forward in the development of super hot geothermal systems? Let's explore. Hello and welcome to the first of two sessions on the super hot rock moonshot. Um, by the way, I didn't name this panel, but I'll point out that although we got to the moon a half a century ago, we do need a space race funded like the moonshot to do this. I'm Bruce Hill. I'm chief geoscientist at uh, Clean Air Task Force. We're an international nonprofit focused on zero carbon energy. And we've hired a team this year to elevate and facilitate the development demonstration of super hot rock energy. So what is super hot rock? Just for everyone in the audience, at 400 degrees Celsius, water is in a super critical state. What that means is it's more fluid and it carries more heat. And by preliminary estimates and measurements, uh, much more energy per well, which gives super hot rock the potential to be competitive. And that's really the key thing right there. Um, with successful advances in drilling and reservoir creation, well completion, uh, it has the potential to be widely distributed. It's zero carbon, uh, it's firm power, and it's high energy, energy density. In other words, it has a small footprint for very large uh, uh, energy, amount of energy. So, um, and we aren't just embarking on this journey. Work has been ongoing for several decades to tap into supercritical hydrothermal systems. The people that have begun to crack the code are right here, represented on two panels that run now from noon Eastern time to three. The first panel is mine, which will focus on the learnings from the very important work that has been done around the world, where are we now? The second panel following this one at 1.30, hosted by my colleague, Philip Ball, will air perspectives on exciting new projects and where we're headed. But probably the most important thing for both panels is how do we get there? I'm honored to have these four panelists and uh, I wanna express my appreciation for their showing up here all hours of the day and night. Uh, for Nori, it's 1 a.m. in the, in, in the and send up. So um, anyway, we have um, Omar Friedlifsson uh, from the Iceland Deep Drilling Project. Uh, they uh, demonstrated that perhaps 35 megawatts from one well could be uh, generated uh, above 400C. Jeffrey Giudetti from Descramble, uh, that's a project in, uh, in Italy, Tuscany, uh, Italy, that uh, demonstrated the hottest known uh, conditions in the well. Uh, Nori Sachia uh, is from the Japan Beyond Brill Project, Toko, Tohoku University, um, investigating, among other things, a brittle ductile transition based on the super hot Kakanda well drilled in the 1990s. And then finally, Egbert Jolie uh, works on GMEX from the University of Potsdam, Germany, and he's investigating drilling super hot wells in Mexico. I'll start by each, asking each of the panel members to briefly introduce themselves, then go. Uh, then each summarize learnings from their projects, then we'll have a break 
Then we'll go into a half hour of discussion, which I hope will proceed more as a formal dinner table dialogue. So uh, with that introduction, I'm going to ask Omar to lead off and give us a short uh, summary of uh, the work at IDDP. Yeah. So good morning, I guess, for some. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Omar Vritlason, and I have been the uh, coordinator for the Iceland Deep Drilling Project called IDDP. The IDDP was established in year 2000, more than 20 years ago, by three leading energy companies in Iceland and by Government Energy Institute. At that time, we also opened the project for an international collaboration and received support from ICTP, US National Science Foundation, European H 2020 program, and international industry companies as we progressed onwards, as well as from the international um, engineering and science community. The purpose was to drill uh, four into <clears throat> four to six hundred degree hot rocks or hydrothermal reservoirs at a temp production, expecting about one order of magnitude increase in power output, say from five megawatt average, volt average, to about 50 megawatts per well electric megawatts. In two or three, we published a feasibility report where we located about 15 potential drill holes in three different high temperature fields in Iceland and set up a priority order in each field. Three years later, in 2006, we were ready to deepen uh, to five kilometer depth, a uh, three kilometer deep production well in Southwest Iceland, which we called the uh, Well of Opportunity for the ITTP. But before that happened, the energy company lost the well during float tests, so IGTP project had to move to another drill site now in Northeast Iceland. The well in Northeast Iceland is, is called the uh, well IGTP 1, and the intention was to drill it down to 4.5 kilometer depth into one of the prioritized drill sites. Shortly before the drilling was to begin, final site preparation, we had to move to a new and more risky drill site where molten rock, which is called magma, could be expected at about three kilometer depth, while geophysical data implied that we would probably not find molten rocks until much deeper still, or closer to 4.5 kilometers. Now in 2009, ITTP-1 well was drilled, but experienced multiple drilling programs down to about 2.1 kilometer depth, where we had to cut the drill string loose several times, cement the bottom part and sidetrack out of the well to continue drilling. After the third side track, we realized that we had been drilling into molten rock, 900 degree Celsius degree hot magma pocket of some sort, and drilling had to be stopped at this 2.1 kilometer depth. And the circumstances, normally people just cement the well and forget it, but the ITTP program decided to, to float the well, and we succeeded very nicely and created the world first magma driven ETS system in 2010 to 2012 during the testing. We managed to deal with hostile fluid chemistry and we're just about to scale up the pilot plan when the two inch surface wall broke, which led to a series of problems. So in the end, we had to control the ITTP well with cold water, which completely ruined the production phase. However, the experiment was a great success and knowing about a huge magma chamber at the still site in Northeast Iceland, we can definitely drill several such magma ETS holes and multiply the current electricity production from the 60 megawatt installed in, in a power plant there. A few years later, in 2016, we were ready to drill the second ITTP well called ITTP2, and now again in Southwest Iceland, and completed that well to 4,650 meter depth into 600 degree hot rocks at 350 bar pressure, surely supercritical conditions. And this was in January 2017. This well surely set another record, world record, for a production well in an active high temperature system. And then we used the following two years to study the well and were ready for production test when we discovered that the production casing had been ruptured. And unfortunately, again, we lost the well, but we had learned a lot. And perhaps the most surprising thing we learned was that the it was the endless circulation losses during drilling we experienced. Drilling blind most of the time, meaning that all the drilling fluid and all the rock cuttings were lost into the formation. And this was both due to high fracture permeability and also due to hydraulic and thermal fracture. 
This means that we can definitely create deep EDS geothermal systems, which would support the overlying conventional system by both pressure and temperature support. At the moment, however, we are more interested in direct production from the super hot reservoirs, where we hope to increase the well production by an order of magnitude, as I said before, from five megawatts roughly to 50 megawatt electric. Now, I think my five to six minutes are up by now, so I stop here, but what we need to see a better casing material in our casing programs and cementing of the wells. I believe such high resistant casing steel is already on the market and needs to be tested in the future super hot wells. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Omar. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Nori, would you uh, tell us a little bit about what's, uh, what's been going on at JBBP and Japan uh, in general on Super Hot Rock? Okay, thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, uh, so uh, here it's uh, it, it is already Tuesday morning, at one a.m. Uh, I'm a little bit sleepy, but uh, <laughs> I, I want to introduce the, our exciting drilling project of the supercritical Joseph Reservoir. So uh, in, in uh, about uh, eleven years ago, 20, 2011, we had a very big earthquake, the Great East Japan earthquake. That is. Uh, Magnitude nine, over 9.0, it's extremely big earthquake. And at that time we had uh, the uh, Fukushima nuclear accident. At that time, 150,000 people can, uh, could escape from a nuclear power plant. And still now, so we spent uh, more than 10 years, but still now 50,000 people cannot go back to their own house, their, their own home due to the uh, nuclear problems and the radiation problems. So the, after the uh, 2011, uh, uh, Japanese government pushing the uh, development of geothermal energy. And uh, But uh, in Japan, we have a huge amount of geothermal energy because uh, in Japan is uh, the volcanic country, but uh, the way, uh, the 80 percent of geothermal energy is located inside the national park. That is the main problem. So, and also that we have a, a hot spring, many many hot springs. We have more than 3,000 hot springs inside Japan, and the Japanese student likes to, to take a bath in in hot springs. So, but the onsen, or that is onsen in Japanese, hot spring onsen owner they don't agree to uh, develop geothermal energy because uh, they want to protect uh, protect their own field of, of hot springs. So instead of the conventional geothermal development, uh, Japanese, sci uh, Japanese scientists and also the Japanese government decided to develop a new uh, frontier of geothermal energy, that which is uh, uh, the supercritical geothermal reservoir. So in 1995 and 19, uh, until 19, 1996, we had a big drilling project, Kakonda project. Uh, that is uh, the, the, the WD1 the drilling. We can, we, we could uh, touch the very hot spring, a hot, te a high temperature uh, fluid, which is over 500 degrees in Celsius. But uh, uh, and uh, we all, all started the, the such kind of supercritical geothermal project. And uh, and now NEDO NEDO is a new energy development organization, which is uh, the kind of uh, the government organization. NEDO started to fund four projects from 2021 to 2023 or 2024 for detailed modeling and the evaluation of supercritical geosum resources as a, the first stage of uh, proof of concept drilling. The location of the site and the uh, constructor uh, 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 Hachimantai, Iwata Prefecture, it close to Kakonda, and another one, the Kakonda, and the South Yuzawa uh, uh, area, it, uh, three of them are located in Tohoku district, northeast part of Japan. It's close to Kakonda, close to WD1 project. And another one is the Kuju, uh, located in Kyushu Island, southwest part of Japan. And then now we are full project of supercritical uh, geothermal uh, 
energy extraction. We call it Japan Beyond Brittle Project, JBBP. So, and the development of hydrothermal system has been done ongoing at each site, and many geological and geophysical and geochemical data are available, available for, the, uh, for this project. And the data obtained from the drilling of WP1A in Kakonda, which borehole temperature exceed, exceeded uh, 500 degrees in Celsius, will be also effectively used to estimate thermal structure at that site. So uh, we are now four, four, four or, or, uh, flow project, uh, the super critical geothermal project. One is Hachimanta Iwate and the Kakonda in Iwate and the South Yuzawa. The three of them are located in Tohoku district, northeast part of Japan. And uh, uh, another one, fourth one is Kuju in Kyushu district, the southwest part of Japan. And uh, the, we are uh, living in a subduction zone, it, which is completely different from Iceland. I, we learned from uh, Iceland IDDP project, but uh, the, the tectonic setting is completely different. I, uh, uh, Iceland is uh, 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 mid-ocean ridge uh, basalt in, in uh, Atlantic Ocean, but in Japan, we are living in the subduction zone in, in the west edge of Pacific Ocean. So the tecton uh, tectonics and the geological setting is completely different from the Iceland. But uh, we, are, we have a very uh, emotional project of uh, the supercritical geothermal development. And uh, uh, so the, uh, that is, a, uh, and the, uh, now we have four uh, uh, candidates for uh, supercritical geothermal uh, project. So that is an outline of supercritical geothermal project from 2021 to 2024. And uh, uh, so now it's, we have several uh, supercritical geothermal project in Japan. And uh, uh, yes, that is the outline of the super critical uh, geosum, a super hot and super critical geosum project in Japan. Okay. Thank you, Nori. Uh, let me go to Egbert next. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm uh, here today as a representative of the Horizon 2020 project GEMEX and uh, the objective of GEMEX was the advanced assessment of unconventional geothermal resources in Mexico with uh, Los Humeros as a potential super hot geothermal site. Los Humeros was selected to better understand the deeper part of the resource where high temperature fluids up to 380 degrees C have been encountered but couldn't be used due to the aggressive chemical characteristics of the fluids. Los Humeros is a quaternary volcanic complex located in the eastern part of the Trans-Mexican volcanic belt. It's exploited since 1990 and the current capacity of the power plant is 94 megawatts. GEMEX uh, started at the end of 2016 with the kickoff meeting in Morelia and ended in 2020 with the final conference in Potsdam in Germany. It was um, jointly coordinated by the Michoacan University in Mexico and the Helmholtz Center Potsdam in Germany. And Actually, the project was composed of two consortia, one in Mexico with nine partners and uh, one in Europe with 24 partners from 10 countries. And most European partners, they are members in the uh, European Energy Research Alliance, ERA, with its joint program, Geothermal. GEMEX um, received a total funding of uh, 20 million euros, provided equally by the Mexican government and the European Commission. The key questions in the project are dominated by understanding the geothermal resource and focused on three major topics, which is heat source, pathways and formation and fluids. And the project was structured into three key pillars, which is resource assessment, reservoir characterization and concept development. Mm -hmm. The resource assessment is focusing more on the bigger picture, like understanding the tectonovolcanic evolution, the fracture distribution, hydrogeology, recharge, in situ stress and temperatures at depth and getting information on the brittle ductile transition. 
reservoir characterization. For this part, we used um, exploration techniques and approaches uh, also used at conventional geothermal sites, which were then tested in the project for their applicability for exploration of super hot systems. And this included also development of a petrophysical database, for example. Then uh, concept development, uh, this part included, for example, a study on suitable casing materials for installations in super hot conditions, high temperature tracers, long-term high pressure, high temperature flow through experiments in the lab, a review on super hot drilling campaigns and the failure modes, as well as recommendations for the monitoring of potential threats for the environment. So technological developments such as new drilling technologies have not been on our agenda. We rather focused on understanding the resource. And the key achievements of the project are very diverse. Um, regarding research, we have been able to use a big multidisciplinary package with different exploration methods. We created a fundamental database that can now be used for further studies and new approaches, including machine learning, for example. So to say GEMEX is a big research investment the project resulted in more than 60 scientific papers and uh, more than 240 conference contributions. Papers are still being published. Um, for the power plant operator, we could provide novel data on the resource, which helps to further develop the conventional geothermal field, which is very, very heterogeneous and very complex. As a result of GMAX, several commercial ideas developed, for example, um, what I mentioned before, materials for high temperature installations, but also novel monitoring technologies using um, reservoir monitoring technologies using gas analytics. And um, one other aspect, GEMEX built a very strong and sustainable network between different institutions, multiple partners in the consortium. They also continue their cooperation in other international projects. So in short, um, GEMEX built a solid database for the future selection of suitable drilling targets for deep wells, but drilling itself was not planned in the first phase. However, the initial ideas in the project preparation phase was the initiation of a second phase where drilling should be included. But due to all the uncertainties as a result of the COVID pandemic, this could not be started. This is very unfortunate because phase two would have been the next logical and necessary step after this large investment. And the goals for the second phase, they were also quite clear, which is integrating the data, defining borehole location and drilling actually. So what's next? Um, well, anything that could follow now needs to be jointly initiated by the Mexican coordinators and the uh, power plant operator. And so far, unfortunately, they didn't receive a positive feedback um, um, from this for the funding agencies. So my personal wish is that the Mexican consortium succeeds with developing a bankable concept um, for a Mexican deep drilling project by building up on the data collected in GMAX. And this could possibly start with an ICDP workshop and uh, ICDP is the International Continental Deep Drilling Program. And ICDP also attended the final conference in Potsdam and realized the substantial efforts made already in the project. So my vision in general for super hot systems, but also how GEMEX could play a role, I believe in the, uh, in the strong potential of super hot resources. However, we need to de-risk such projects and only comprehensive data can help to do so. A uh, commercial enterprise would never do such a broad exploration work and therefore we still need large exploration or large research projects like GEMEX. And I think GEMEX can play a key role in the geothermal community mm -hmm. by providing a digital data laboratory where many things can still be tested and further developed. We need in particular better integration, visualization of data and generally easy concepts to understand such concepts, uh, complex data. However, those projects, they also need sustainability. So my vision is also an appeal today. We need continuity in such projects. We need long-term research commitment. And the conventional project phase of three years in this dimension is totally insufficient. And we need to think more in the direction of programs to build up knowledge on the long-term, like our colleagues in, in New Zealand or in Iceland, uh, what they are doing. And however, at the same time, we also need to learn how and when it's time to convert research results into application and commercialize projects and innovation and support start up, startups. So research is the key. That's how I understand it. But only uh, large investments can actually turn the key around and be a game changer. My third wish, 
I have four wishes in total. <laughs> My third wish is uh, to unite projects um, working on super hot resources. We can learn a lot from each other. And uh, during JMEX, uh, we proposed the first session on supercritical systems at the GRC in 2018 to bring t uh, people together. Uh, currently, we're also working on a, on a movie concept, Magma Power 360, which hopefully becomes a 360 degree movie in order to explain the topic to the general public, but also to decision makers. Why? Because uh, geotherm is still like a black box to many people, and it's difficult to explain this black box. And visualization can do a really great job for experts, but also for the general public, and we also need them. And my last point here, uh, we have learned so much on super hot resources or geothermal in general, but there's more than geothermal out there. And we can also learn from other disciplines like research on hydrothermal ore deposits, for example. They are working in a similar geological setting just at the different temporal stage. And um, yeah, with these four statements, I would like to conclude my brief overview of GEMEX. Bear, that was excellent. And uh, you get me excited just thinking about uh, the work that will come in the future. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that three of these projects, the Iceland Deep Drilling Project, Desramble, and uh, GEMEX were all funded by the EU Horizon 2020 program. Uh, so um, we need to think about how to elevate uh, and continue these great projects. So with that, let's talk about uh, Vanel, Jeffrey, and um, and what you've uh, and your colleagues have done in Tuscany. Yes, thank you, Bruce. Um, I'm really honored to share the floor with other uh, colleagues that uh, made projects in such topic. So my name is Jeff Giudetti and I am a geologist, a geochemist, uh, and I work for an Green Power. And I am responsible for the geo resource uh, assessment uh, team. Um, I will introduce you to the Descrumble project. Uh, which is located in Tuscany, uh, more specifically in Laderello, which is the birthplace of geothermal energy, as you may know. So the project was, as you said, uh, Bruce, was founded uh, by you in the framework of Horizon 2020. The consortium was made up by NL, of course, and also by the National Research Council of Italy, two universities from Germany, uh, namely uh, Kiel, Haken and the Freiberg, and one company from Norway, which is the Sintef. So um, uh, total funding was about 16 million euros and the, uh, the, the, the grant from the EU was 6.7 uh, million euros. Uh, so what is just to, to give you an idea about the, why we have the idea of to drill the Venelle area in, the, in, in Laderello. As you may know, in the Laderello, the heat source uh, of the geothermal, uh, area is thought to be a very young and shallow intrusion, granitic intrusion. Uh, at this top, it reaches uh, about three kilometer depth. And uh, um, in the 80s and 90s, seismic uh, exploration evidenced uh, a strong reflector at those depths. And many hypotheses were done on the uh, nature of, this, uh, uh, of these reflections. So one of these was uh, the brittle to ductile uh, boundary at 450 Celsius degrees, or if you prefer, the place where to find the supercritical uh, fluids, of course. So the idea of the project uh, was uh, to drill down to this depth, which is very close to the surface in the Venelle area. Venelle is a well, already existing well, and to reach the reflector to investigate uh, its nature. And uh, we, we want to do that uh, safely, of course, in safety, in safety conditions, and developing new techniques for drilling and uh, testing new materials for these very challenging uh, conditions. So what uh, we have done before starting drilling, the, the project uh, lasted 36 months from uh, 2015 to 2018. What they have done in these three years was uh, uh, to set up a seismic monitoring in the area, just to be sure that the connection between the drilling and, of course, uh, the natural seismicity of the area, which is uh, in any case very high, and a gas monitoring system during, uh, uh, during the drilling to be certain uh, to avoid any um, inflow, uncontrolled inflow of fluids inside the well during drilling. 
before starting also we set up models uh, more accurate thermal modeling and the more accurate uh, seismic uh, modeling in, in by which i mean we need to add more accurate vision of the depth of the seismic reflector because you know that uh, the that the acquisition of seismic survey is made in time so we need to convert that in depth and to do that we uh, we add more precise value of the depth of the of the seismic reflector uh, so we study also new bit to use in order to avoid the potential issues during drilling and also new cement, new casing on the market, already available on the market, a new drilling fluid and a, a, a new tool to measure uh, the temperature and pressure condition in such a uh, TMP uh, situations. Uh, so what we uh, obtained so far, uh, we observed the, the drilling was straight, I would say, we only had a problem uh, during drilling, because the mud, the, the mud fluid was not performing as we expected, and I will explain why. So we get a, a lot of uh, stuck of the pipes during drilling, and we decided to shift from mud to water. But that one, that decision uh, resulted in the in the terminating the, the the drilling because we had no more safety conditions. Could not, uh, in case of, of uh, finding high pressure fluid, we could not avoid any blowout of the well or underground blowout. Uh, we observed during the drilling an increase in the rate of penetration in the ROP while handling the top of these seismic signals. And we uh, so were certainty that the, we, we had the, the certainty to have handled the, our uh, mining target. Um, so, a part uh, of the problem of the mud, uh, the well was a success, I would say. We decided to stop for safety reasons, just for those, but it was a strong uh, decision to be, to be made. And the final output was that we, we measured 515 Celsius at depth with a pressure of above 300 bars. So, we were in supercritical condition, of course. But unluckily, we did not found any commercial available fluid. So the, the, it was a dry well, unluckily. The new tool that was uh, uh, tested for this, uh, for this project, uh, of course, uh, ended, it, it worked perfectly, but the condition that we found were above those that we, we think that we would have found. So it was not uh, designed to, to work at above 500 Celsius degrees. Uh, regarding the other achievements, we observed the no connection, temporal or spatial connections between seismicity, national, natural occurring seismicity in the drill area and the drilling, which is very important. And also we observed the no uh, connections between the gases, reactive gases, CO2, H2S, or C1 to C5 gases during drilling and uh, uh, finding permeability. I mean, Probably we observed some gases, uh, CO2 and methane, but uh, we thought that they were uh, they were there because of the reaction with the rock or degradation of the mud. We just observed a small increase in H2S at the very bottom of the well, but we decided to stop. So um, we cannot say what uh, what uh, to what this was uh, due. Um, so I, I think this is just a broad overview of our uh, project. I, I think I have said uh, anything about the project. So that's it. Thank you. We have um, about six or seven minutes left to start some questions, and then we're going to go to, to a break. Uh, and after that break, we'll come back and we'll do some, some more dialogue and then take some uh, questions from the audience. Um, let me go around the table quickly here, each of you, you know, a minute or so. Um, there are so many different questions I've got for you all, but let's just start out with what are the key innovations that are needed for you to succeed to demonstrate uh, the success of supercritical systems? What, what are the key the key elements um, that uh, will bring you success. So um, let me let me start um, with you back again, um, Omar. Okay, uh, definitely proper caching material. 
and proper cementing procedure. Because without casings, we are we, we lose the wells and can't produce them. So so we need proper material, and I believe it's already on the market. Uh, it's called Timital 475, but I'm not a salesman, so I should maybe not mention that, but there may be something similar um, on the market as well. Uh, this needs some engineering experts really to, to uh, continue with. That's absolutely a key element. I think we can deal with the surface uh, installment. I think we have proper valves on, on the surface, even though that is, can be tricky too. But uh, casing, I mean, the problem with the casing is the thermal cycling, which is because of heating and cooling and heating and cooling. The steel don't simply doesn't tolerate it if it is expands too much. And in such a deep well, it can expand maybe up to 15 meters, 3,000 meter casing. So we need to have materials that are not expanding or not contracting. And we have some um, couplings that are called uh, flexible couplings where, we, where each pipe can expand and contract into the coupling house. So that's one of the in inventions that we have already made. So I think that is the first issue to, to say we have to solve that to, to be able to continue. Great. Uh, Nori, do you have a, a thought on um, the most probably key innovation uh, to demonstrate uh, the supercritical systems um, that you face in Japan? Oh, sorry. So I'm a little bit confused. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. So I, I'm a little bit confusing. So please skip, skip me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. Jeffrey, you want to take a shot at that? You've yes, already I, given us some, some ideas, but. Yes. Please. Yes. I agree with Omar, of course, because the material uh, for uh, the well is really important. As is, he was saying, the stressing of the material between cycles of hot and cold could be significant. In, from our experience, I would say also a particular attention must be put on the, on the mud, on the mud fluid, uh, because that causes the, uh, the stopping of our project. So in our experience, also the mud uh, can be uh, very important, uh, at least in Tuscany, because from what I, from the first, from this first, uh, I mean, uh, people that are that we are here, it must be stressed, stressed that each situation is different. I mean, the geological conditions, uh, the thermal condition, fluid condition, as we have heard, are different from place to place. So from our experience in Tuscany, uh, I would say for sure the casing material, but also uh, the mud sequence because the temperature were so hot above 500 Celsius that we mm. had uh, problems with that. Egbert? Yeah, this is, this is quite a technical discussion. I, I, I'm a geologist, so um, for that reason, <laughs> I also think that it's, um, that it's quite important to, uh, to get a good and thorough understanding of the, of the geology down there. And it's important to translate the measured parameters into geothermal properties, and then also find a way to, to integrate the different data. And I think in, in, in some areas um, that can be still an issue. So innovation needs, uh, is required also, also in that perspective. And another thing, I, I'm, I'm quite sure we're going to cover that later on, is also um, uh, innovations in the sense of what is the actual concepts to make those systems um, working in the way we want it to work. And um, that depends very much, again, on the geological situation, which is different in each project. I'm going to go to Nori and ask you a specific question. Now we have one minute. Uh, Brittle ductile transition. Um, I want to explore this a little bit more, but one of the key issues uh, for uh, super hot rock or for, for uh, hot dry rock systems is if you're injecting cold water uh, under pressure, um, you could have uh, uh, induced seismicity. You have any quick comments on that, Nori? And we can come back to that too. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. So, so we, in Japan, we have many uh, induced seismicity. So it's a very big problem for society. So uh, super critical, uh, yeah, yes. 
uh, the induced seismicity, that is the most important problem for development of the supercritical geothermal resources. We'll, we'll probe that um, a little bit a little bit later, but I think we're about to go to our break here. Um, so um, thank you all for now, and we'll see you back in, uh, I think, about 20 minutes.